Hello. Right. So welcome back to the second session in the Ease Virtual Conference. So this is a debate. Uh, very exciting. We have two former presidents of Ease who are going to discuss, um, alternately propose that either it is acceptable to reduce quality assurance processes in order to fast track important research in times of crisis, or it is not acceptable to do so. Um, so I believe we now have Hervé, but before we start, sorry, we have to do the poll. So we're going to take a poll and I'm going to pose the question, here we go. It is acceptable to reduce quality assurance processes in order to fast track important research in times of crisis. So can all of those of you who are out there, uh, over 130 of you, vote yes or no, and then at the end, we will ask you to vote again. So you have a minute or two to vote. Please do so now. Okay, then while you're doing that, I am going to introduce Hervé. I can't see him. Hervé, are you online or do we go to Anna first? I think in the interest of time, Anna will go to you first. Okay, um, so the format is going to be each presenter will show, uh, will talk for about 10 minutes, then they have three minutes to respond to each other, and then we might have some questions from the chat, and then we'll vote again and see if anyone has managed to, if either of the presenters has managed to change the minds of the audience. Um, so, Anna. Anna is uh, Chair of the Department of Research in Biomedicine and Health at the University of Split in Croatia and hosted our conference there a few years ago, Happy Memories, and Editor of the Journal of Global Health. So over to Anna and you have 10 minutes. Okay, do you see my slides and you hear me good <laughs> okay so i will start um let me just okay so you are seeing my screen now okay hello everybody this is really an interesting uh, exercise for ease uh, we and academia have uh, uh, now mastered all kinds of platforms to communicate because we now teach online. Um, and although this has, was supposed to be the response uh, to the initial debate question that it is acceptable to reduce the, the quality of uh, 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 assurance processes in order to fast track important research in times of crisis, I would argue that it is not acceptable to reduce uh, quality of uh, what we published in, in scientific journals. So let me start uh, with the, the fact that we all know that editors are responsible for the integrity of the published record, so that we have to ensure that what it was published is checked for quality and integrity. And I don't think that uh, being in, in a crisis <clears throat> really um, disengages us or let us uh, do uh, things that are not uh, um, adequate for our role as journal editors. As you know, a uh, long time ago, um, I started a journal uh, in the middle of the war in uh, Croatia. And uh, despite uh, even of a greater crisis for a single uh, country, uh, we did try to uh, uh, stand uh, for the integrity of the published record and to ensure that everything is done uh, properly. Also, uh, because of that, we are gatekeepers, not only about good research, but we're also gatekeepers for good publishing practices and abandoning good publishing practices would not uh, be uh, good for what we do. And I think that is particularly important in health research where incorrect information, uh, as, uh, as, as I wrote here, can provide misinformation to the research community, but it can also affect uh, a wider public because it can affect policy and decision making in health practice. 
And as we know, and we have already talked about the COVID-19 pandemic, it's a very good example. If you look at uh, the number of publications, if you just type in COVID-19 in PubMed, you get uh, 21,000 uh, results and they are all published in 2020. So this is an, an enormous amount of uh, publication. It, it is indeed difficult to deal with them all, uh, but is... Uh, um, something that uh, we need to be prepared and uh, especially uh, this may be burdensome uh, uh, for uh, journals that are small they don't they that they are academic uh, scholarly journals they don't have the support of, of big publishers and they really felt the brunt of crisis in, in uh, biomedicine and just to remind you if you for example take uh, similar data for when Ebola was uh, uh, proclaimed to be a pandemic uh, in 2014 and 15. I think that the number of publications then, although it was a uh, pandemic, was around 5,000. So uh, much, much uh, less than, than what we see now. So um, we do have a crisis and this is a crisis in publication, but I think uh, as journals, we, and, and, and in the publishing world in general, we have uh, uh, the tools and the ways to deal with it. Also, uh, there are other outlets. Uh, we should maybe talk about uh, uh, this blurring border between the traditional and non-traditional outlets. Uh, um, and uh, it's equally difficult to assess uh, what is valid, uh, what uh, has integrity in what is published on preprints. And we have seen that over time, preprints, although we often say, oh, this is not peer review research, they have also increased uh, this gatekeeping for uh, the integrity of what is published in uh, a preprint uh, server. So I think that we are seeing uh, perhaps a greater change in how we deal with information. Uh, and uh, there have already been concerns, you are probably aware of uh, an editorial from Gemma that they were worried about uh, the fact that they have uh, discovered that same patients were reported uh, in different reports on COVID-19, which then, of course, uh, um, undermines the validity of what we see and uh, skews the data, and we have a, a important uh, publication bias. And this was one of the reasons why EASE uh, had its statement on the quality standards. So uh, we are aware of it, and we should work on improving what we do so that we can uh, stay uh, for what we or our job is, and that is ensuring the, the integrity of the published record. And we have already examples that we can do things fast and with quality. And I will just take, I know that everybody wants to talk about the Lancet and, and retractions and new general medicine, but if we look at the experiences that are already there, so we already have uh, uh, ways how we can deal rapidly uh, with the, the important findings like this 10 plus 10 rapid decision faster publications for randomized controlled trials in the Lancet where, the, where they promise that they will review within 10 days and then they will be published within the next 10 days. So uh, there are already ways that we can, that can be done. And um, uh, what Inés said, uh, now we may switch to pre-submission inquiries. There are ways where we can uh, uh, deal with um, a greater flood and a greater burden of submissions where we can uh, see that uh, this is not for our journal. And this has been uh, uh, shown in, in research. I remember a study from the BMJ that looked at whether editors can assess a paper when they read just an uh, abstract or when they read the whole paper and they didn't find any difference in the editorial uh, decision on desk rejection. So it can be done even uh, faster in any situation such as uh, uh, the crisis. And especially when we're talking about health, um, uh, there are other ways where we can uh, share information. It doesn't have to be published. And I'm just showing this because this was supposed to be the topic of uh, uh, this year's Cochrane Colloquium in Toronto, which was cancelled because it, 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 uh, it was supposed to be in September. There are ways in health where we have this rapid learning health system where we do use databases, where we do use what is called the, the world uh, data or, or real life uh, data where we can collect uh, enormous amounts of information and use it uh, to uh, evaluate it and then to solve the problem that has been identified in, uh, uh, in the beginning. So um, I will conclude with the argument that there is no reason to believe that we can 
adapt the system of uh, what we do in publishing uh, to function properly in the times of crisis because we already have tools uh, and maybe these and our duty as a, as an organization of editors is to see how these tools and ways can be available even to smaller journals to uh, academic scholarly journals that uh, probably has, have a greater brunt of crisis than more established journals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Beautifully done. So um, we do now have Hervé, I'm delighted to say. So Hervé Mezenev, as I said, a previous president of EASE and a pre previous editor of European Science Editing. Um, based in Paris, but I know he spent a lot in the Alps. And for those of you who can see him, he's got a beautiful picture of snowy mountains behind him. He does this to make me really jealous every time we have a call. There we go. So, right. So Hervé has the unenviable task um, as an EASE president of proposing this, this motion um, and we're very pleased that he, he took on this, this challenge. So Hervé, uh, it is acceptable to reduce quality assurance processes in order to fast track important research in times of crisis. Over to you. Bonjour, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, you can see my slides. No, you cannot currently. Let me, because. Up, up, up. Sorry, sorry. So it's coming. Yes. Okay. Okay. Excuse me. I used uh, green color because it's green, and yes, it is acceptable. Thank you for the invite invitation. I work in public health and I would like to thank Alison Clayson and Pippa Smart who has helped me to prepare this talk. In France, few experts explain on the media that randomized control trials cannot be run during a pandemic. Too long to organize, too much time to run, placebo is not ethical, and the pandemic will last a few months. So journals cannot publish the best science because it doesn't exist. We are in a public health crisis. I forgot to say thank you to everybody because I am probably the only man on this panel. Excuse me, we have so many ladies today. So we are in a public health crisis. Readers, they search for instant information to drive their decisions and their research. They want immediate information. Researchers, they consider that times of crisis offer a good opportunity to add papers to their CVs and they want to publish. They search for grants and they want to add any publication in order to feed their dossier for grants. Urgency, pandemic crisis can disappear within a few weeks or months, so journals must speed up their process. There is a competition between journals, so taking risk is a winning game. New data are immediately covered in the media with the journal's name, so journals have to take risk. We already talked about the the editorial strategy, but a journal could have new columns, new space, as you know, for the pandemic. And a journal has to publish calls explaining that publication delays are shortened. Journals must have correspondence, increase letters, viewpoints, even if non-informative, because readers want debate, discussions, opinion, as well as data. Journals can publish summaries of studies, summaries of protocols, and create a new format to publish data based on few information, and they can call for such summaries. Studies, studies could be too long to provide information. So journals accept interim analysis, pre preliminary data. 
case reports. Duplication of cases increases the spread of information. Case reports help clinicians to make decisions to develop better treatment for patients. Case reports must be disseminated for different specialists with a warning that they are duplicate publications. So duplication of publications will benefit readers, but you add a warning. We already talked about the fast track. Peer review, as we say, must be shortened. Give only a few days to reviewers and make that condition clear when solicited. Finding busy reviewers who are available is very difficult. So reviewers are absent and editors can take full decision, considering that corrections must be minimal. Decreased remarks to authors. They don't have access to laboratories. They don't have time as the crisis cannot wait for long-term solutions. Don't search for the best methods. Accept surrogate endpoints, short-term studies, small samples, preliminary data. Stating a tendency only in a paper could guide professionals. They don't search for evidence-based data that take times and will cover after the crisis is passed. They search for ideas, they search for opinions. Editors always have to make judgments and compromises. And poor English is not a reason for re rejection. We already discussed this is statement that was welcome in the middle of April, but the, I copied one paragraph and I want to focus on this sentence to avoid misinterpretation, but also to facilitate the rapid sharing of information. We encourage editors to ensure that authors include a statement of limitations on their research. So you can publish tendencies, preliminary data, summaries, and you add a statement of limitations. It encourages editors to reduce quality assurance standards and with addict those limitations. Authors must be fair in acknowledging those limitations. Transparency, that's the best. Journals, not just authors, have a particular responsibility to identify, disclose any shortcuts and any departures from the standards of best practice in science and in science publishing. This is transparency, a kind of quality insurance and in its own, right? Because it acknowledges the deviation from the usual standards. It serves to explain how science really works and to educate the media who must communicate and interpret this accelerated research for political leaders, decision makers, and the public. I am not arguing for bad science, but science should not be published but health professionals don't know how to manage new situations. They want to support for their decisions. They search for rapid publication of research. To avoid wasting time, preliminary findings are worthwhile publishing. Most of the researchers want to share their experience as soon as possible as the war could be over by a few months. So journals need to adapt, accept preliminary data, even weak data with limitations, accept any kind of comments to guide readers, fast peer review with sometimes an internal review by editors without reviewers, and paper with messages rather than evidence that needs too much time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hervé, beautifully done. Um, the chat's going, going is very lively. Um, so what we're going to do now is ask each presenter to respond briefly to the other presentation. 
Um, so Anna will be first in this instance. So Anna, I think straight back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, and thanks, Hervé. Great uh, presentation. But of course, I, I don't agree with you because you say that public health crisis is like a war and requires urgent and immediate decision. Yes, but these uh, uh, decisions have to be based on best data that we have and best results. We cannot just base them on anything. And I have been through war and I have been through uh, this crisis. And uh, I think that uh, good data is uh, um, important here. You say that uh, uh, papers should have messages rather than evidence and I think in times of crisis we have to have evidence and not messages because messages can be wrong and they can be distorted but data cannot if uh, what we published is good. You also uh, uh, say that uh, we accept a preliminary data that we don't uh, demand the best methods, but the best methods, if we don't use them, what we publish can then affect not only a few people, but they can uh, affect nations and have a global impact and they may kill if things are wrong, they may kill uh, more people that we want. And you also say that readers search for ideas and opinions. I think that in the scientific journals, our readers search for good data and uh, proper research and proper science. And I think that we, as I said, and I see one of the questions, so that 10 plus 10 of the last seems to be uh, reducing the quality insurance processes, but that's already something that we see, that we know that exists, that it has been used now for, I think it's 2015. It would be great if Lancet would publish data on, on the effectiveness of their 10 plus 10 approach. Uh, and we already have data that uh, rapid publishing works. And as I said, journals are not the only uh, point here uh, because there are other ways how we can share information and learn quickly in a time of crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, beautifully done. We're, we're well on within our time. So uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. And I will choose some from the chat. And the first one's just come up in Q and A. So can I can I uh, say a few words? Yes, you can. Yes, I'm just trying to. Pull. You you were. Do you want to start by the questions? Because uh, no, 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 Ave, you will respond to Anna. But while we're doing that, if you have a question you wish to pose, okay. to speakers, can you put it in the Q and A briefly in the form of a question, please? So you can do that while Ave is responding to Anna. So Ave, over to you. Thank you. I, I disagree with you, Anna. First, good quality assurance processes do not prevent fabrication or falsification of data. So reducing quality does not mean poor quality paper. That's the first uh, argument. You, uh, fabrication or falsification of data will exist anyway. Transparency is a key word because fast conclusion on incomplete, incomplete uh, small samples uh, uh, must be lab labeled as such and you have to be transparent and then you accept short studies if limitations are stated. As you know, political leaders do sometimes lie to the public, but it is also true as a pandemic has demonstrated that political messages to citizens must legitimately change from week to week. So you can sometimes lie and then later on you can change your mind. That's the evolving science uh, and research that informs public health measures. But a better educated public, better informed public is with the scientific communities community, you have the better chances of ensuring trust in science because people have understood that science is messy, that the process is long and slow. So there is always a positive side of crisis. So this window of, of opportunity to accelerate debate, to uh, inform more public and everything. And I will conclude it is an ethical obligation for journals, authors, and editors always to state that exceptionally due, due to the crisis, 
there have been deviation for normal best practice. So it's transparency and you can publish any opinions and any messages. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hervé. So there you have it, two different points of view. And um, so we, we're doing very well. We have about 15 minutes for questions. I'm going to take chair's prerogative and ask one. Um, so medical journals often have a section in the discussion on the limitations of the paper. Sometimes it's strengths and limitations and sometimes it's just limitations. Um, and I wondered both whether we should make that more widespread, so all journals should be asking for that, to, to expose the weaknesses in the paper, but where further research is needed and um, generalizability is, is not good, and also whether we should make those limitations visible in the abstract, given that we know many readers either can't see more than the abstract or don't have time to see more than the abstract. So I think we'll stay in the same order. We we'll go to Anna first and then Hervé. Limitation. Um, yeah, um, yeah, definitely. But uh, I, I think th this is uh, given because, you know, if you look at consult and if you get in any reporting guideline, limitations of the study need to be uh, discussed or part of a discussion uh, section. But I, I would also like uh, to say that uh, uh, what we're discussing here, we, we're kind of trying to discuss journals, but we shouldn't discuss only journals, but we should discuss the whole scientific community because Hervé said, of course, you know, if it's fraudulent data, journals cannot do much. But then what, what is the role of, of the institutions? What is the role of the community? Uh, and uh, when you talk about politics, I will just quote uh, Firchow, who was the founder of modern pathophysiology, who said that medicine is a social science and that politics is just medicine on a grander scale. Uh, we, have to, we have to see that uh, we, what we see currently is also confirmatory bias that includes political confirmatory bias in peer review that we are aware of. We just want to hear what we want to, we hear what we want to hear. Why not open everything? Why is data not opened? If the data from surgery was in an open format, then this shouldn't be done. But then again, uh, journals also have uh, the um, uh, obligation to run a, a proper uh, review. If it has to take time for sensitive and for important data, let it take time. I think it's better to wait than uh, to rush and uh, start wars in many ways. And this is how wars are started. I think uh, journal editors are only messengers of uh, information and all others in the system also have their responsibility. Um, Thank you, Anna. Elvin? We have many, many controversies between scientists and uh, deciding where is good science, where is poor science is very difficult because you have a lot of opinion leaders with pros and cons and for the public and media it's very difficult to find their way. So journals have to publish any messages, any information with few control because if you only want those very evidence-based medicine, it will be too long. And uh, another question, I, I fully agree with the limitations and with the limitations in the abstract, uh, that was the question, maybe adding something about the limitation in the abstract. Thank you, Evans. Right, sorry, I'm, I'm reading the questions as well. So, yeah. Right, so the question, so the first one I'm going to put to you, actually Rene Malero posed on the chat earlier, so Rene asked whether open peer review would help in this time of the COVID pandemic. Um, so Anna, would open peer review help? And I think- No. Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think open data uh, would. So this is the reason, you know, why we have preprints, why we have uh, immediate analysis of data. And if you want to be sure, if you want evidence, then we can go through a lengthy process of checking the data and peer review for originality and so on and so on. That's why we have statistical reviewers. Some reviewers, you know, I think we have different expectations of peer review. Um, uh, from peer reviewer, we want to see whether this is novel, whether this is interesting, whether this is a breakthrough. But then we have statistical reviewers that 
that go through data to see whether this breakthrough is supported by uh, proper evidence. So I think uh, open peer review would not solve this. I think that we have then to have transparency of everything, including data, including the protocol, not, not even because you can also read data. So why not have uh, openness of protocol of the expect expected uh, statistical analysis, then the openness of data, and then, of course, at the end, it can be the open peer review. But just, you know, sticking it to, to the journal editors that they are not doing their job uh, properly and that things get published that shouldn't publish, uh, and we have these expectations, global expectations that things be solved now, right now, I, I think we cannot do all that. Have Anna, I have to agree <laughs> to agree with you, Anna, anyway, <laughs> on these points. <laughs> but, but anyway, you are wrong at all time, but not on this point. Um, yes, I agree, because open peer review could also uh, increase delays of publication, because you have to prepare, and it could increase the mess of the debate in the medias and in the public, you know. Jour journalists go and they will add uh, discussion and false debate if they have access to peer reviewers' uh, discussion. Okay, well, building on that, I'm going to pose a question from Emma Hodcroft. So Emma writes, as a scientist who's been highly engaged in SciComm, we've often had a burden of trying to catch up with with media that surrounds published papers and explain how, why it's wrong. Um, so as well as the front side process before publication, which would be editorial scrutiny and peer review, should journals be more flexible to post publishing review where an article may be retracted or modified based on real time feedback by other specialists? Mm. So uh, I, I think what I'm going to slightly interpret what Emma's saying, because obviously we have retraction, we have expressions of concern and retraction for where we think there are errors in the study. But I, I get the feeling Emma might be saying sort of more quick and dirty publication and then the ability not necessarily to retract, but to say, in a way, what science always says, what I published last month was was right but only as far as it went, and now we know there are flaws in it. Yeah, um, I would say that uh, in this case, you know, what we have preprints for. So we have already ways of discussing data. So why not have these things on, on preprint when people can check it and then if it uh, is, you know, cut down immediately, then of course it does, doesn't work. But if, it's, uh, 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 if the community accepts it, then it can be published in a journal and can be uh, even more uh, thoroughly reviewed. Uh, I think that pre-publication is not only pre-print uh, uh, pre service, but also the institutions and funding organizations. Uh, uh, the institutions should also stand behind what their authors publish and, and the research that is done there and ensure what is then sent to uh, uh, the uh, journals and what is published uh, that uh, is uh, with integrity. So, as I said, we shouldn't look only at journals that we see in a traditional sense, but especially in crisis, other uh, uh, ways of uh, sharing data, interpreting data and looking at data are important. No. <clears throat> You're going to turn us all into statisticians now, Anna. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> You're going to make us all have to learn a lot more statistics. Well, well, uh, what uh, they say now that, uh, like uh, one of the developments, important thing that a medical doctor has to learn that searching databases and critically assessing uh, research is equally important as a stethoscope in current day. Okay, Elve. Don't use uh, statisticians as reviewers because you will delay everything and you will not publish uh, short term and small samples. Uh, so avoid the statisticians in the peer review process. <laughs> I have a, 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 just one more uh, comment to add. Institutions in terms of integrity have been very quiet in those times, you know. Uh, sometimes we had a lot of discussions, especially I, uh, I mean to the French uh, scene. Institutions have been totally quiet, uh, and uh, we have been we have seen poor papers, and uh, that's very strange. That's all. 
Okay, so we have a question from Dr. Krishna Kumar. Thank you, Ch thank you, Tachalam. And my apologies if I've pronounced that incorrectly. Um, so he asks, can we have a metric that gets published along with the papers, grading, quality of methodology, review, etc.? cetera? Um, I think there are initiatives out there in the different journals and have some versions of this. It, in a way, it goes back to the open peer reviews. So Anna, I don't know if you'd want to comment on that and perhaps give some background for those who aren't familiar with those processes. Or if not, we... Yeah, but maybe Hervé can go first this time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just to change for a bit. Published, or, or just it may, may not be a metric. So should journals be publishing more information about what they've done with the paper? Yes, and, and we have to, to increase focus on those uh, reporting guidelines, which are uh, not sufficiently used by a lot of journals. It's spreading a, a little bit more now, but... Uh, if possible, it should be mandatory to use those reporting guidelines, which is the first and simple way to increase quality. But can we do more? I don't know. Anna? Yeah. I will just say that uh, now we have turned into a discussion about biomedicine and in biomedicine open peer review and uh, in a way we can see that in a few years uh, time journal switch to F1000 research model where a paper is an involving uh, publication that has lots of versions and that people comment on it. But I think we also have to see this in uh, other fields. You know, what about humanities, uh, social sciences? Uh, uh, we don't see that this openness is present in other fields. So we have to think what it means for them and why it is not there. And the reasons, because, you know, you can have crisis and I'm sure that now we're going to read a lot of uh, uh, not sufficiently rigorous methodological research on the psychological effects of COVID pandemics. And we will make all kinds of conclusions about that or about the history of it or about the politics of it. You know, it's not only biomedicine that we're discussing, but we have to discuss a greater um, discipline uh, wide uh, problem of uh, peer review and the trust in data that is published. Okay, thank you, Anna. So it's time to do our poll again. So Mary will put up the poll and we'll all vote. I forgot first time, I was too busy chairing, so I better not vote this time. So now having heard the arguments of Please our- vote yes. <laughs> Shh. Somebody mute that man. Okay, <laughs> so. Vote again. Oh, host and panelists can't vote anyway, so I shouldn't have to vote. So do you still, or what do you think now, whether it is acceptable to reduce quality assurance processes in order to fast track important research in times of crisis? And, and I, I think- I cannot vote. You can't vote, no. No. You've had your say. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, at some point this will leave my screen and I will be given, um, the results, but while we're waiting. Uh, if, I, if I can just say, because I see here uh, one comment, a surprise, both speakers are against open peer review. Who said that? You know, we just said that we were for open data and open uh, publishing and open peer review. But uh, I don't think that this discussion will go on in other areas of uh, science. Mm. And we may have a completely different uh, argument uh, for other fields. Yeah. Yeah. I think people also, that there are various definitions in peer review. So we, uh, at Lancet Psychiatry, where I work, we have double blind peer review, but the reviewers can identify themselves if they wish. And some do. Um, and that's stated in the instruction. If they want to, they sign their reviews uh, and that information is, is forwarded to the authors. Um, and I think that openness will come because I think several people think oh, I'm not allowed to sign my review. It's like, no, you are. Um, so that's, that's open peer review in that the reviewer is identified, but it, those reviews are not shared publicly. They are, are confidential between the reviewer, the authors and the editors. Um, so we're still... So Mary is going to share the final results first. Okay. So... This is vote number two. Uh, so we have 35% in favour of the <laughs> processes and 65 
against. Um, but the point is not actually who votes for this, it's how many of you changed your mind. So the winner of the debate will be whoever managed to swing it. So at the beginning, we have 35, 65 now. What do we have at the start, Mary? I feel like I should be on a game show. We had 2377. <laughs> the swing has been towards yes. Is that correct? So Hervé has increased his share. So I think that makes Hervé the winner of the debate, even though, as an easy <laughs> president, I'm pleased to say that most of us still think <laughs> So Anna, next time I will <laughs> yes. offer you a dinner and a beer and everything you want next time we meet. Okay. No problem. No problem. Thank I still have. <laughs> very much. We, we can't clap. Perhaps we should do wavy hands like they do at some... <laughs> Thank you very much. No clapping, wavy hands. Um, so listen up because I now have to make an important announcement. So we're going to have a 15 minute break until quarter past 11, British summer time. Um, at this point, you have to leave this session and you're going to your different breakout sessions.